Okay, everyone, good afternoon. Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm Christine Mallinson, the director of the Center for Social Science Scholarship, which coordinates our annual Social Sciences Forum lecture series. I'm also an affiliate faculty member in the Department of Gender, Women's and Sexuality Studies, so I'm doubly thrilled to be here today. This is our second Social Sciences Forum lecture of the semester. It's also the Department of Gender, Women's and Sexuality Studies 13th annual Kornman lecture. I want to thank everyone in the department for organizing the lecture today, as well as the many co-sponsors of the event. Um, before we begin, I want to take a very brief moment to mention our third Social Sciences Forum lecture on four, at 4 p.m. on Wednesday, March 31st. Um, that will also be the Department of History's annual low lecture. And we'll have Dr. Vincent Brown of Harvard, Harvard University and Dr. Mario Lane Cars of UMBC who will be discussing their recently published books about New World slave rebellions in Jamaica and Guyana with Dr. Sharika Crawford of the US Naval Academy moderating that event. You can find more information on our website, socialscience.umbc.edu. I'd like to also invite you to engage with us on social media. We're on Facebook and Twitter at UMBC SocSci and on Instagram at cs3.umbc. Uh, last but not least, a few housekeeping details. Um, attendees are all muted with video off for the lecture, but we welcome your comments and questions for the speaker. Just put those into the Q&A box at any point, and uh, the speaker will address those following the talk. And then I believe captioning is available through the multimedia viewer in your bottom, the bottom right-hand corner of your uh, display panel. So thank you all again for being here today, and I will now turn things over to Dr. Katie Kine, faculty in the Department of Gender, Women's, and Sexuality Studies. Thank you so much, Christine, and thank you to everybody uh, for being here. On behalf of the core faculty, the coordinating committee, and our affiliate faculty, I'd like to welcome all of you to the 13th annual Kornman Lecture in Gender, Women's, and Sexuality Studies. I'm Catherine Kine. I'm a lecturer in the department here. The Kornman Lecture Series is one in which we seek to highlight the wealth of contemporary scholarship on gender and sexuality that's being produced in gender, women's, and sexuality studies and across the discipline. This series is named for Dr. Joan Kornman, the founding director of women's studies at UMBC, as well as the founding director of the Center for Women Technology and Emeritus Professor of English. We wouldn't have such a vital intellectual community in the GWSP and English departments or in the interdisciplinary humanities in general without her vision and leadership. Um, I want to take a second to recognize our co-sponsors. This year, the lecture is co-sponsored by the Provost Office, the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, the Departments of Africana Studies, American Studies, Media and Communication Studies, Political Science and Social Work, the Public Humanities Minor, and the Initiatives for Identity, Inclusion, and Belonging. Now, it's such an honor for me to be able to introduce our guest to you today. I know that I'm not alone in feeling that we're incredibly lucky to have Dr. Jennifer Nash here with us. Dr. Nash is currently the Jean Fosto Barr Professor of Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies at Duke University, and she's one of the single most exciting and celebrated scholars of Black feminism and intersectional, intersectionality theory today. In her 2014 work, The Black Body in Ecstasy, Reading Race, Reading Pornography, Nash pushed us to rethink Black feminism's theory of representation using readings of racialized pornography that focused on Black women's pleasure to disrupt narratives of Black women's representation rooted only in injury and recovery. In Black Feminism Reimagined After Intersectionality, which was the 2019 recipient of the National Women's Studies Association Gloria Enzo Dua Book Prize, Nash urged a re-examining of Black women's relationship to the university and to intersectionality, often thought of as Black feminism's greatest intellectual contribution. Nash argues for a letting go of defensiveness of the origins and directions of intersectionality, which she says dominate discourses of intersectionality now for Black feminists, and sees this as a way of foregoing the negative affects attached to defensiveness and instead opening up new possibilities for world making and knowledge production for Black feminism. Today's talk in the room, Women of Color Doulas in a State of Emergency, comes from Dr. Nash's highly anticipated upcoming book, Birthing Black Mothers, which comes out with Duke, from Duke University Press this August. The book examines the figure of the Black mother, often held up as a symbol of crisis and loss, and uses examples of Black mother self-representation to imagine narratives of Black motherhood that don't 
locate the precarity of Black life within Black women. Her work has been called brave, important, challenging, groundbreaking, and transformative. And when you step back, the thread connecting all of Dr. Nash's work has been her insistence on placing love for Black feminism, for Black women, for the generations of work that have come before and are still to come at its center. Dr. Nash's work never fails to raise the bar and to challenge and does so with a joy and commitment that are truly inspiring. And I know today's talk will be no different. Personally for me, this is especially an honor to be able to introduce to you today someone whom I also have the pleasure of calling a dear friend. Jen, I'm so excited to have you here. So please, without further ado, everybody, please join me in welcoming um, she can't see or hear you, so Jen, you're going to have to just take my word for it, uh, but please join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer C. Nash. Thank you so much. Um, first, let me thank Amy and Al for all of their behind-the-scenes work. I really appreciate it. Um, and Katie, Dr. Kine, Katie, thank you for the tremendously um, warm introduction. I should say uh, Katie and I have spent pretty much every day of the last 10 years in conversation. And um, I am both intellectually and personally grateful for that. So uh, I'm going to embark on what is what become one of the most stressful aspects of daily life for me, which is the sharing of my screen. So I'm going to first just make sure that that's going to work. Um, just hang on one second and bear with me. So what I'm going to do um, in the first part of the talk is share some images, which uh, it seems are going to work. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to share some images as I talk about the kind of broad project of my new book, Birthing Black Mothers. And after I give kind of an overview of the project, I'm going to stop my screen share and then talk in greater detail about doulas. Okay, it looks like that worked. So uh, this is this portion is the kind of overview. In April 2019, aspiring Democratic Party presidential nominee. Elizabeth Warren participated in She the People, a forum for women of color voters. Warren, who had developed a reputation for her detailed policy recommendations, unveiled her newest innovation. If Black women are three to four times more likely to die during childbirth, Warren suggested that the state provide hospitals with financial incentives to improve health outcomes for Black mothers. She said, Doctors and nurses don't hear African American women's issues the same way that they hear things from white women. We got to change that and we got to change it fast because people's lives are at stake. Warren was hailed for making black maternal health a campaign issue and for her investment in offering a clear policy intervention designed to safeguard black maternal life. Over the course of 2019 other presidential candidates also wielded the specter of black maternal death as a sign of their commitment to the multiply marginalized. Kirsten Gillibrand reminded viewers of one democratic debate, quote, I sat down with Eric Garner's mother and I can tell you when you've lost your son, when he's begged for breath, when you know he said I can't breathe so many times, that person should be fired. Kamala Harris too invoked Eric Garner's mother insisting that, quote, now I would like to also talk about this conversation about Eric Garner because I too met with his mother and just to remind us um, of earlier moments before 2019, in 2016, Hillary Clinton invited the mothers of the movement to appear on stage with her at the Democratic National Convention and to confer um, their endorsement upon her. And these are pictures of Hillary Clinton um, with Sabrina Fulton, Trayvon Martin's mother, and with Leslie McSpadden, Michael Brown's mother. So Black mothers were again and again figured as the memory keepers of slain Black children, particularly black boys and men, and as always braced for inevitable future loss. They were icons of trauma, grief, heroism, and death, trotted out by an array of figures on the US left as, in Angela Harris's words, the ultimate example of how bad things are. And black mothers emphatically placed themselves in the public sphere to speak about the anti-black conditions that were killing their children and to advocate for their needs, including perhaps the most basic need what Joshua Chambers Latson has called more life. In so doing, they rendered motherhood a powerful vehicle for making visible a set of conditions that have long been and continue to be wholly unlivable for Black people. 
Birthing Black Mothers, my new book, argues that if Black mothers have become politically legible because of their newly visible but long-standing proximity to their dead children, they have also recently entered the public consciousness in a new way. Not simply proximate to their children's anticipated death, Black mothers are now imagined as themselves occupying death worlds because of their distinct vulnerability to a decidedly not new condition, medical racism and obstetric violence. The last five years have seen an outpouring of journalistic work in the New York Times, PBS, NPR, Mother Jones, Democracy Now!, to name just a few sources that have taken up this issue. All of them have spotlighted staggeringly high Black maternal and infant mortality rates and the myriad ways that institutionalized medicine fails its Black mothers. Um, and one of the things I started to do when I, when I embarked on this project was collecting some of these infographics that try to, in different ways, um, chart the disparity between Black and non-Black maternal and infant mortality. So here's one of those images. Um, and here's another sort of set of charts that have attempted to, to map the disparity. Taken together, this journalistic work has made a singular point. Racism is to blame for the life or death crisis that Black mothers and their children face. Um, and in fact, the New York Times Magazine did a cover story in 2018 using this phrase life or death crisis, which has come to sort of uh, proliferate. So my new book probes a moment where the longstanding conditions of the ordinary have become newly framed as a crisis and where Black motherhood itself has become a site of cultural interest, empathy, fascination, support, and seemingly benign regulation, both by the biopolitical state and by Black feminists as they have collaborated to figure Black mothers as living in crisis. This book argues that Black mothers in the US have become spectacularly and dangerously visible through the frame of crisis, one that, it's, one that insists on their spatial and temporal location in a death world that is described as reminiscent of the nation's imagined past, even as it is consistent with the conditions of the present. While crisis has made the precarity of Black mothering newly visible, if not remediable, it has also tethered Black maternal flesh to disorder, even as it is not the disorder of earlier eras, namely pathology and poverty. It is precisely because Black motherhood is now cast as suffering rather than pathological, as tragic rather than self-destructive, as traumatized rather than deviant, that the crisis frame can be both deeply seductive and rhetorically effective. Yet the rhetoric of crisis is part of an enduring and troubling tradition of rendering Black women generally and Black mothers specifically into symbols, even if now Black mothers are symbols of tragic heroism rather than deviance. My new book traces how the crisis frame has transformed Black mothers into a distinct form of left political currency during the era of Black Lives Matter. Black mothers become a kind of left political currency, a woke political credential, when the category Black mother comes to refer not to a form of relationality, a set of practices, a form of labor, or an embodied experience, but instead to a political category that is a synonym for pain. Of course, the relegation of Black mothers to the realm of the symbolic has been inherent to the US project of race making since the nation's inception. What is distinctive about the political moment that constitutes the backdrop of my analysis is that Black mothers are figured as bodies that warrant compassion, education, and support because they are living in crisis. As the US left responds and responds as in quotes to the anti Blackness, misogyny, and transphobia of the Trump administration, and to the sea of non-indictments and non-convictions of state officials who have slain Black people, as we engage in the national reckoning that George Floyd's murder generated, Black mothers are a valuable currency that can confer left bona fides on the speaker who selectively invokes them. And as I argue in my book, the U.S. left and Black feminists have, even if for different rationales, tethered Black mothers to a new set of controlling images that center trauma and injury bringing Black mothers into view only through their capacity to stand for brokenness of a different kind. So this is sort of um, overarching project or provocation of the book. And so for the bulk of my time today, I want to talk about doulas. 
Perfect. Okay. It's easy to spot Lauren in the crowded grocery store in Chicago's South Loop. She's wearing a bright yellow shirt that says Mama Midwife Fierce. When we sit down at a table in the store's small cafe, Lauren is flanked by her four-year-old daughter and her infant son who is napping in his car seat. We are both, in an unspoken way, deeply aware that the presence of her children means that we can only talk in short spurts. So Lauren talks with a sense of urgency, and she often bangs her hands against the table to emphasize an important point. She leans in and says to me, the birth world is focused on birth justice. This means how do we parent? How do we parent when parents are incarcerated? I have a doula friend who's starting a farm and her handle is the farm doula because you know, pregnant women need to eat. We need to eat. And I think that's really important to people in Chicago where you know, our right to parent, to have babies and to not get killed by the police are really, really things that are emergent. I always felt like me becoming a midwife and being a doula was an emergency. For Lauren, a black midwife, lactation consultant, and doula working on Chicago's South Side, birth work is life work. And the process of catching a baby is as much about caring for birthing black bodies as it is about ensuring pregnant women have access to healthy food and saving community members from gunshot wounds. Working as a birth doula is both laboring in an emergency and responding to an emergency. The year after my conversation with Lauren, Chicago Magazine celebrated women of color doulas for their collective work on the city's front lines. And you can see two of those images on your screen. Women of color doulas, because of their capacity to move inside and outside of conventionally medicalized spaces, were hailed as the necessary and perhaps only stopgap, preventing black mothers and children from dying from obstetric violence. The article revealed that the work of women of color doulas is multifaceted. There is a baby to be caught, a birther whose physical and psychic labor needs to be supported, and a wider black community desperately in need of care that respects their collective bodily autonomy and fundamental personhood. In the wake of a new public attention to the black maternal mortality crisis, birth workers, particularly birth doulas, have become increasingly visible agents of birth justice. Doula-assisted pregnancies have been described as successful, not only in transforming some birthers' perinatal experiences, but also in improving the health of mothers and infants, even as there remains debate about what precisely it is that makes doula's presence in the birthing room transformative. Doulas, particularly women of color doulas, are imagined to play their most politically an ethically significant role in the birthing experiences of Black mothers who birth in a milieu marked by stark racial disparities and often deathly outcomes. In this talk, I turn sustained attention to women of color doulas, examining them as actors who have become foot soldiers in a birth justice movement that is rooted in Black feminist praxis and increasingly supported by both state actors and nonprofit organizations invested in eradicating the crisis. This movement recognizes the endless threats against Black life as beginning in utero, and it draws connections among state violence, environmental racism, nutrition, quality schools, and access to transportation to craft a broad conception of the conditions necessary for Black life to thrive. Thus, the movement thinks capaciously about the radical interventions and reparative political work that doulas can stage simply by being in the room, which is the phrase that so many of my interlocutors used to describe being in the delivery room. Under the auspices of reproductive justice, women of color doulas are increasingly recruited by community-based doula programs and by state finance doula initiatives to transform the birthing experiences of women of color. Women of color doulas also disproportionately fill the ranks of pro bono doula programs that provide low cost or free doula services to vulnerable communities. These pro bono programs have been celebrated by the state in the face of crisis, even as that celebration unfolds with little or no financial backing for these programs and with little or no compensation for the doulas whose labor is imagined as integral to preserving black life. Women of color doulas are increasingly hailed by both the state and by black feminists as medical missionaries whose anti-medical ethics are precisely what is required to save the lives of black women laboring in medicalized spaces. 
In this talk, I treat women of color doulas as actors who have, by being in the room, put into practice and brought into institutional visibility a set of Black feminist frameworks, including allegiances to reproductive justice, a commitment to Black life, and an investment in care and love as radical world-making forms of being together. Moreover, I treat women of color doulas as instrumental in recasting the perinatal Black body not as a medical or an embodied category, but a political one. For women of color doulas, the pregnant Black body is vulnerable and precarious, subjected or potentially subjected to myriad forms of anti-Black violence. The role of the doula is to protect the fragility of Black maternal life and to ensure the safe arrival of Black infant life. More than that, the doula's willingness to carefully catch a baby is thought to act as an early psychic immunization against other forms of violence inflicted on Black people. Yet the rhetoric of the urgency of being in the room can produce the temporality of crisis that doulas attempt to ameliorate. In the book, I trace three tensions that undergird contemporary doula practice, questions about training and professionalization, questions about the meaning of medicalization, and questions about the exceptionality of birth. And today I'll talk about the first two and not the third. In all three cases, while doulas are called on by the state, NGOs, and birth justice advocates laboring in the name of Black feminism to be agents of crisis mitigation, these tensions complicate efforts to resolve the crisis Black mothers face, and at times further suture Black maternal bodies to crisis, placing these bodies as in need of repair and transformation. My analysis today draws on 23 interviews I conducted in 2018 with birth doulas, most of whom identified as women of color, all of whom worked in the Chicago metro area. For the doulas whom I interviewed, the specificity of practicing birth work in Chicago in a city described as basically inventing modern segregation and as marked by equally intense, intensely segregated patterns of gun violence was paramount to how they described the urgency of their work. And these uh, slides, capture some of the national coverage that has that surrounded and continues to surround gun violence in Chicago. Um, some of you might remember the moment when Donald Trump threatened to send in the feds to Chicago and the image below his tweet uh, is a graphic of 2018. Um, each dot is uh, a homicide in, in Metro Chicago. So uh, Lauren explicitly described birth work as a form of Black life-giving staged in the face of Chicago's gun epidemic. As she described her training, she noted, we ended our doula training with pneumatics gunshot wound training. And I remember having a deep conversation with my husband and one of my friends about how knowing how to potentially save someone from a gunshot wound was related to birth. For Lauren, being a Black doula practicing birth work in the context of Chicago, required seeing both delivering babies and treating gun wounds as practices of caring for Black life. This is work that is a response to a state of emergency. So I'm going to stop my share and... Okay, I think that worked. Okay. So section one. Uh, I, I tentatively call this section foot soldiers and love warriors, but we'll see if that sticks. So uh, we began, Samantha told me when I asked her about her doula training by talking about how we were called to the work. Sometimes she tells me the calling comes in your dreams. Samantha's training ended with newly minted doulas washing each other's feet, a profound symbol of birth work as a commitment to service. For Samantha, a training focused on an ethos of service that posited birth work as a commitment to life was an urgent introduction to the practice of being in the room. What should the training be for those who are charged with the responsibility of saving Black mothers' lives? What preparation is required to be a foot soldier? And if the state enlists or even recruits those foot soldiers, how involved should it be in their training? Though my interlocutors all identified as birth doulas, they labored under vastly different conditions. One works full-time as a doula in an agency she runs with two business partners. Two work full-time through a combination of solo practice and agency work. And all of the other doulas that I interviewed were engaged in part-time birth work and other full-time work, generally in feminized fields like childcare. Moreover, the number of births they had attended and the amount of training they had completed varied significantly. 
and the nature of their trainings was quite different, with some extensively knowledgeable about the physiology of birth and others describing their training as rooted in the spiritual aspects of birth. I take this variation in training, certification, and experience as evidence of the paraprofessionalism of doula work. And I argue that the paraprofessionalism of the work, its capacity to evade standardization, is precisely what enables many doulas to describe their labor as politically transformative. Indeed, I want to sit both with how doula's labor is hailed as urgent and with how it is unregulated, with doula's training experiences vastly differing. In highlighting the paraprofessionalism of the field, I'm interested both in how women of color doulas flag this as a deeply political and even fugitive component of their work, and in what it means for the state to rhetorically invest in Black mothers' health by encouraging care administered by largely unregulated actors. When I use the term paraprofessional, I do not mean it as evaluation or devaluation of the tremendous physical, emotional, and spiritual work that doulas perform as advocates, healers, guides, witnesses, and travelers, to use a few of the terms my interlocutors deployed to describe their jobs. Instead, I mean it to describe the lack of regulation and organization of a birthing profession that is increasingly held as the touchstone of reproductive justice and as precisely the birthing innovation that will save Black women and children's lives. Paraprofessionalism describes the low-tech nature of doula's work. Indeed, one doula described her approach as low-tech, high-touch. Uh, so low-tech captures how being together is the radical birth practice at the heart of doula's work. I also use paraprofessionalism to capture the fact that while doulas emphasize that they are not medical practitioners and often define themselves against conventional medical institutions, they remain actors who perform the majority of their labor in medicalized spaces, namely hospitals, and alongside workers whose professions are not at all paraprofessional, including midwives, lactation consultants, nurses, and obstetricians. Doula's capacities to reside in medical spaces while maintaining minimal, if any, medical training can make murky the relationship between birth work and medical care, a murkiness that is perhaps most profound, and I would argue most potentially most dangerous, for birthing mothers who are at once reminded that doulas are not medical professionals, yet they encounter them in medical, in medical settings. All of the doulas I interviewed had participated in a two or three day intensive training, though the content of that training varied tremendously. Some classes are led by formal organizations like the doulas of North America, or childbirth and postpartum professional association, or to labor, or pro doula. Others are facilitated by community organizations or even by campus initiatives specifically designed to train women of color doulas. Most of the doulas I interviewed identified strongly with their training institution, particularly those who had elected community based doula training, which were often imagined to index a commitment to women of color birthing bodies. For most doulas, the training was an experience of self transformation, community building and solidarity much more than it was an orientation to the physiology of labor or the physical experience of birth. Faith, for example, described her training as organized around, in her words, spiritual and emotional connection. And she noted that her training transformed a group of strangers into what she called doula sisters, women she still texts every day to discuss challenging births, to share what she called doula stories, and to exchange affirming messages. Morgan described her training as, quote, centered in traditional Black practices from the Black midwives. She said, it was all just very centered in Blackness. It was very centered in traditional Black practices that have gotten lost throughout time from when the granny midwives would come from Africa and bring a lot of those practices here. We are the women who birthed an entire country. We have raised white babies. We birthed white babies. We birthed our own babies. For Morgan, Doula training was a return to a kind of native practice and a recognition of Black women's long and powerful birthing histories. Perhaps most controversial was the question of how much doula training should focus on the business of birth work. A number of doulas mentioned that one of the profession's main organizations, the for-profit pro-doula, had become far too focused on encouraging doulas to organize viable businesses and had lost sight of the compassionate ethics at the heart of birth work. 
Produla, with its insistence that, in the words of it, its website, it wants you to be fulfilled emotionally and financially by this rewarding career, distinguishes itself from other doula certification programs by its heavy emphasis on professionalization and its member benefits, which include discounted printing, discounted liability insurance, and access to networking events. In its investment in making birth work a viable full-time profession for its members, the organization is often cast as making birth work a neoliberal business endeavor. Moreover, pro doula's emphasis on doulas as workers often led its founder, Randy Patterson, to critique volunteer doula initiatives, the pro bono efforts most closely associated with birth justice and most often staffed by women of color. For Patterson, these volunteer efforts undermine the economic viability of the profession by discounting birth workers' labors. Yet the women of color doulas I spoke to had all participated in the city's volunteer doula program, and they found it to be both a valuable form of service that enabled them to work with the communities with whom they identified, and an important training ground that allowed them to attend the number of births required to earn formal accreditation if they were seeking it. And I should say, I think there's something um, really complicated about the idea of uh, getting trained or getting your sort of practice hours um, on, the on the most vulnerable birthing people. Despite women of color doulas critiques of corporate logics entering birth work, some noted the importance of professionalization to make possible the birthing togetherness that doulas promise. Jasmine, for example, described the doulas of North America certification process as in her words, a bit of a process, but she said it was ultimately appealing because quote, I wanna be accessible to multiple moms and partners. The credentials just look nice. You put the abbreviations next to your name, for Jasmine, the abbreviations were imagined as something that would appeal to a wider clientele and might even enable her to make birth work a viable profession. She also insisted that a, that a formal certification would make her easier to find. While doulas often advertise on websites like doulamatch.com, professional organizations like the doulas of North America maintain searchable databases of their members, thus allowing clients to find local credentialized doulas with ease. My women of color doula interlocutors almost all found clients through word of mouth or through active solicitation. And Jasmine insisted that her completion of a formal training allowed her to attract, in her words, a steadier stream of clients. Um, and I should say, like two of my interlocutors mentioned um, how much they would do active solicitation. One in particular said to me, if she was a target and saw a pregnant person, she would say, hey, do you know what a doula is? Do you need a doula? Um, which she found to be a really empowering form of, edu of educating folks in the community, but also a very unsustainable way to make a living. Community-based doula trainers often set their community orientation against the imagined corporate logics of organizations like ProDoula. Miriam, who works at a nationally recognized community-based program, described her training as powerful because, quote, it comes from the people who will benefit from the learning. While community-based programs like Miriam's are often cast as more radical than their corporate counterparts, it is worth noting that this particular community-based program actually demanded far more doula training than national organizations like the doulas of North America. Here, 23-hour sessions cover topics including the physiology of pregnancy, stages of labor, birth processes, breastfeeding, C-sections, and infant death, as opposed to the 14 hours of training provided by many professional organizations. The community-based program emphasized its desire to train doulas to work in their own communities. Yet they emphasized in much the same vein as bemoaned corporate models that doulas are not volunteers. Miriam said, one of our central components is that the community-based doulas are employed and preferably they're employed with a salary living wage, not an hourly wage, not a per birth wage, but an ongoing dependable every two weeks, same amount you can depend on to live with wage. We are not looking for people to be volunteers. The training then aspires to make doula work livable for its trainees in much the same way oftentimes disavowed corporate programs do. Ultimately, the fight over professionalization was imagined as an index of a birth worker's politics. Is birth work simply a job or is it an opportunity to be a, a guide on a birthing person's spiritual journey? If as many doulas, particularly women of color doulas indicated, one is called to birth work, then what is the place of a doula's desire for a livable wage in relationship to this calling? And how does a doula 
reconcile a desire to serve vulnerable populations who might not be able to afford birth work with her own need to survive. If professionalization debates constituted a battle over the ethics of the work itself, doulas also debated the lack of standardization in the field. Doulas are outliers in the larger field of birth work. Midwives and lactation consultants, the birth professions often associated with doulas, require substantial training, certification, and licensure, and thus they are expensive to enter. And many doulas noted that the cost associated with meeting credentializing mandates have made those professions unavailable to women of color. Miriam, who began her career as a lactation consultant, noted the impossibility of finding a Black lactation consultant in Illinois because of the cost of certification and the demands that she felt had been imposed only to the benefit of the field's credentializing bodies. And I should say throughout my interviews, people would constantly say to me, I heard there was a Black lactation consultant somewhere in Illinois, but she disappeared. So this, this sort of like mythical Black lactation consultant was like the unicorn haunting, haunting my research. Um, indeed, for some doulas, including Miriam, the growing visibility of doulas uh, led to anxieties around possibilities for standardization for uniform certification requirements that could exclude women of color, unleash further competitiveness, and make impossible what many women of color doulas I spoke to had been doing long before they even got trained, practicing doula work. Miriam suggested that any push towards standardization would simply serve the field's professional organizations, not birthing people, and especially not birthing Black mothers. She said, what happens with standardization is the one who can make the most money is the one who ends up on top. The one who has the highest credentials ends up on top. Making everybody ascribe to one standard is oftentimes the enemy of true equity. The threat of standardization and even professionalization is its erosion of equity and its exclusivity. Standardization undermines the field's paraprofessionalism, which for the doulas I described constitutes the radical promise of the field its capacity to labor in medical spaces and subvert those logics, its capacity to bring intimacy into institutional spaces, and its insistence that physical pain can be responded to with pressure points, massage, and breathing together. For those doulas who view birth work as a calling, the field's radical paraprofessionalism affords them the opportunity to select clients who match their ethics, namely those who are imagined as most vulnerable to forms of birth violence. A number of women of color doulas articulated a preference for working with women of color clients or described their pro-Black orientation, a term Brianna, one of my interlocutors, used. Samantha, for example, noted that she had not worked with a white client, and she emphatically stated, I don't feel safe with white women. Sydney suggested that women of color and white clients come to birth work with different agendas and aspirations and that her practice aligned with the priorities of her women of color clients. She said, women of color and queer birthers need a doula for birth justice. White birthers use doulas because they want boutique birthing experiences. And Imani, who split her work between her solo practice and laboring for an agency, described her dislike of the agency's primarily affluent suburban white clients, even as she appreciated the steadiness of the work. She said, the owner of the agency has completely catered to people in the suburbs. She's catered to that demographic, that socioeconomic status. Those are the clients. Those are their attitudes about who I am and what I am there to do, especially for postpartum clients. It tends to be like I'm there for servitude. One of the benefits of solo women of color doula practice then is the ability to eschew professional and medical norms of distance and to embrace the possibility of friendship and intimacy with clients. All of the women of color doulas I talked to describe birthing together as the beginning of a long lasting friendship. And for many, the friendships born through birth constitute the radical possibility of, do of doula work to remake black mothers and black communities. Imani said, I see it as building that community. You have more and more people. A doula becomes your friend. Your midwife becomes your friend. Then you have this vast network of people who are constantly looking out and supporting you especially when it comes to the health disparity, because if you can have a sister come with you every time you go to the doctor, things are very different just having another person there. For Imani, the capacity to select Black clients allows her to nurture precisely the transformations she imagines birthing together to make possible, granting Black mothers access to a nurturing and caring community. 
Uh, the heart of the complex politics of doulas paraprofessionalism is the elevation of doulas to medical missionaries in the face of crisis. The state has increasingly latched onto doulas, and I can say more about that in the Q&A, um, birth workers who labor in a largely unregulated and anti-standardized field as the solution to the problem of Black maternal and infant death. Yet the outsourcing of care to non-medical staff can seem a troubling solution to a problem that unfolds in medicalized spaces and that implicates institutionalized medicine. Put differently, if doulas are the bodies mobilized by the state to save Black women's lives, what does it mean that they're not required to be licensed or credentialed, that many are minimally conventionally trained? And what does it mean that the state has outsourced Black maternal and infant health to workers who are governed by their own caste system? Highly paid doulas laboring in white agencies are often able to sustain full-time doula work, and Black solo practitioners generally must seek other employment, particularly low-wage work, to do the birth work that they want. In posing these questions, I'm not at all critical of doulas who engage in this demanding labor out of a genuine belief in the possibility of care as transformative, particularly for Black mothers and children. Rather, as feminists continue to map our institutional entanglements, it is worth us rigor rigorously interrogating what it means for the solution to what has been deemed a crisis in Black women's health care to be an increased state reliance on a politically committed, committed group of laborers who are organized, at least at times, around a rejection of formal certifications and professionalism. We might then ask how the state's embrace of doula's fugitive practices might actually stand as evidence of the state's deep divestment in Black maternal health. I want to say a little bit about um, what I call the aesthetics of birth before I, before I close. Imani described an unmedicated birth as presenting Black mothers with an unparalleled opportunity. She told me, I'll say spiritually, if you have an unmedicated birth or a birth without a lot of intervention, you get to see probably for the first time for a lot of people how your body can come through for you. If doulas collective labor can produce a healthy birth that makes possible black life, doulas also doulas often share a collective sense that how birth unfolds with or without medication, with or without other forms of medical intervention, indexes something about the birth's capacity to produce meaning for black mothers, black families, and black communities. Unmedicated births are often imagined as the touchstone of doula-led birthing even if not all doula facilitated births are unmedicated. While most doulas use the term medicated and unmedicated to describe birthing experiences, a few still use the term natural interchangeably with unmedicated, capturing a collectively held perception that unmedicated births are the hallmark of the body's natural state. Indeed, all of the doulas that I talked to emphasized a desire to treat pregnancy, not as a time of unwellness that warrants medical intervention, but as a natural part of a birthing person's life, one that should be treated with minimal medical intervention and maximum respect for the body's inherent birthing process. While an unmedicated birth was the preference of every doula I interviewed, the rationale undergirding this preference was disputed. For some, an anti-medicalization politic unfolded as a critique of medical capitalism. The violence of medical temporality inflicts itself on maternal flesh in the forms of epidurals and compulsory C-sections, and also by a refusal to simply let birthing bodies birth in their own time. At other times, the preference for unmedicated birth was rooted in a desire for the spiritual transformation of Black mothers and thus Black communities, a transformation that was thought to be made possible only through natural birthing methods. In these cases, natural birth was imagined to produce more natural forms of Black motherhood. Women of color doulas often cast the medicalization of pregnancy and labor as a particular kind of obstetric violence inflicted on Black women that seeks to regulate Black women's reproductivity. Brianna, for example, described how her doula practice is shaped by her own traumatic birthing experiences. She said, I went with the midwives and they were a good experience, but the midwife kept asking me the same question. I got to wondering, do you ask everybody that about birth control? about having a hysterectomy, about permanent birth control. I told you no, and you keep asking me. I told her I'm getting offended because you keep asking me and I keep telling you no. Do you ask white women this all the time? I'm only on baby number two. For Brianna, it is the medicalization of pregnancy and labor 
the institutionalized institutionalization of medical authority that allows medical staff to encourage women of color to seek permanent birth control and that permits doctors to police what she called her quote plus size black woman body her pro black stance then requires an anti medicalization stance since it is medicine that is the site of anti black misogynistic violence the space that seeks to curtail black women's reproductive freedom for other women of color doulas, critiques of medicalized births are also criticisms of the violence inherent to medicalized spaces. Imani noted that she encouraged all of her women of color clients to birth at home. She said, I just started to play back every experience besides when I was a child, as an independent person, every experience I've had in a doctor's office. It was never good. And I think they made assumptions about me, maybe because I looked so young. I was just like, with all of that, plus everything I had researched about infant and maternal mortality in the Black population, I thought, I don't want to chance it. What's risky is for me to go into a place where I know I won't be respected. For Imani, home is cast as a site of Black women's safety and control, a place of autonomy and respect, and the hospital as a site of risk, of gendered and racial violence, a death world where a Black mother has to guard her yet unborn child and her own body's health. For other women of color doulas, an anti-medicalization stance constitutes a critique of medical capitalism. Sydney described conventional medicine as undergirded by an attempt to place all bodies on a normative timeline, while a timeline that birthing bodies simply refuse. She said, doctors and nurses, with the exception of midwives, just think of all the things that can go wrong, and they preemptively treat it versus letting things happen in their own time. Physicians have time limits. They're taught that birth has to happen in this particular way, in this particular time. You're past your due date, you have to have an induction. Here, medical time is imagined as a structure of discipline, a normalizing device that seeks to align birthing bodies with constructed conceptions of time. Moreover, some doulas emphasize that the hypermedicalization of birth allows doctors and insurance companies to earn money. Epidurals, painkillers, and other drugs are additional items billed to patients that enable doctors and hospitals to profit from birth. Brianna noted that her own birthing experience taught her to, quote, see dollar signs everywhere, with each pill procedure and expert opinion wearing a price tag that she would ultimately bear. That many doulas also charge money for their labor is, of course, another tension undergirding BirthWorks' anti-medicalization worldview, as doulas never cast their own needs for an income as part of medical capitalism. The same critique of medicalization often unfolded as a spiritual one, an analysis of unmedicated birth as a rich opportunity for Black mothers' self-discovery. For some doulas, medicated pregnancies rob mothers of an experience to recognize unknown strength, grace, or endurance. Imani said, if you have an unmedicated birth or a birth without a lot of interventions, you get to see probably for the first time how your body can come through for you. Sometimes people compare it to running a marathon. Without medications, you can experience that. And when you're showing up against a challenge, when your body shows up and it's completely without your thought, it builds this level of trust in something that's unseen and something you can't touch. Medicalization forecloses an important opportunity for mothers to recognize their body's inherent strength, to develop a kind of faith in what Imani calls something that's unseen. For Imani, this potential for transformation through pain is important for Black mothers, since, as she notes, if you can birth your baby and you feel like everything this baby needs, I got, I can do it. That changes the way you parent. It changes your family structure. It changes the way people's children grow up. It's for the mom. It's for the baby. It's for the community to be fully empowered. Unmedicated births, then, empower Black mothers to mother differently with a fundamental sense of their own capacity and with a deep regard for their embodied strength and wisdom. Unmedicated births thus serve various kinds of aesthetic and political work for women of color doulas. The preference for unmedicated births is often articulated as saving Black women from the violence of medical intervention, and even from the violence of the hospital, the scene of risk. Yet unmedicated births are often hailed because of their transformative capacity for Black mothers and for Black communities, and thus are hailed as a gateway into a different kind of sociality and into maternal practices rooted in strength, endurance, and internal reserve. For some doulas, the experience of enduring pain and coming through it stands as a metaphor for the kinds of emotional and psychic reserves required of Black mothers generally. 
Thus, unmedicated birth is a kind of metaphor for the faith in what can't be seen, precisely the kind of faith that Black mothering in the midst of crisis requires. In this regard, unmedicated birth is cast as a crucial preparation for Black motherhood and as a central metaphor for Black mothering in crisis. So I'm going to wrap up. Um, so Audrey, who is trained as a social worker, told me, I incorporate a lot of mental health services in my doula work. My first prenatal visit is usually around anxieties, a lot of concerns, because I feel like whatever mental blockage you have is going to come out in your birth. If you have fears around giving birth, if you have some kind of trauma you've experienced, it really blocks you from having a successful birth. You stop yourself from having that full agency to do what your body does. She emphasizes all of my interlocutors did that the labor of women of color doulas far exceeds catching a baby. It includes thinking about how to hold space for black life, considering black tenderness and black love as necessary preconditions for ushering life into the world. That it involves understanding the intimate connections between the gun violence epidemic, mental health services, environmental justice and parenting. This talk argues that the rhetoric doulas mobilize to make visible the importance of being in the room participates in remaking the category of Black mother, transforming burning Black women's bodies into highly politicized spaces. At once, women of color doula's labor interrupts the crisis facing Black mothers by placing doula's bodies alongside burning Black mothers' bodies in the side of the crisis, the delivery room. And yet women of color doula's work on behalf of Black mothers often reproduces the ongoing cultural tendency to endlessly yoke Black women's bodies to trauma injury and suffering in the service of uplifting them, shoring up the notion of Black mothers' bodies as the scene of the crisis. As doulas, particularly women of color doulas, are increasingly held by the state and by nonprofits as evidence of a commitment to eradicating maternal and infant health disparities, Black feminists must struggle with how and why the state has invested in paraprofessional women of color birth worker labor, rather than a wholesale reimagination of institutionalized medicine as a solution to Black maternal and infant mortality. I'm equally invested in having Black feminists struggle with a moment in which our own tools, analytics, and investments in love, care, and spirituality have been harnessed by the state and other institutions in the creation of a low-wage care work industry populated by women of color who are often juggling other low-wage feminized jobs as they engage in the community service of affirming Black life. This is a moment where the struggle for Black children and mothers to quite literally live is still exclusively and entirely in our own hands. This is, of course, an older Black feminist lesson. In 1974, the Combahee River Collective noted, or perhaps warned us, that, quote, the only people who care enough about us to work consistently for our liberation are us. Despite the discursive explosion of the rhetoric of crisis, politicians gesturing to the need to eradicate maternal health disparities, and journalists writing about medical apartheid. It remains the case, thanks largely to efforts by women of color birth workers to make visible the benefits of doulas, that the only people laboring for Black mothers' health are Black women. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Nash, for that really thoughtful and generative uh, presentation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start our Q&A. We have about 30 minutes for Q&A. Um, so go ahead and remember, you can use the Q&A chat, which is on the lower right-hand side um, under the three ellipses. Our first question is from Jessica Burstrom. Jessica asks, are there any indications as to why the Black maternal mortality rate, already horrifically high, increased after 2007? Thank you for the question. Um, I read nothing that offers an explanation for that. Um, and I guess two things come to mind with your question. One is that I think there's been, um, since about 2016, 2017, as I mentioned in the talk, this kind of real uptake in journalistic attention to the Black maternal health crisis. And um, what's been so fascinating is that despite this proliferation of attention, the Black maternal mortality disparity, health disparity has not changed at all. Um, and so there's one article where I think her name is Jessica Jones says that she's sort of struck by um, at once constantly opening every newspaper and reading coverage of the crisis 
And increasingly, it's not just journalistic coverage, it's also legislative efforts, like the one that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk with Elizabeth Warren's proposal, that there are these efforts and gestures and attention and actually not much changing in terms of outcomes. Um, one thing is for sure, and I, there's been one of the things that this journalistic attention has, has made possible um, is kind of spotlighting um, the day-to-day -day workings of medical racism. And so, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, all of this work underscores that medical racism and nothing else is to blame for these disparities. And so I think there's been increased interventions around challenging medical racism, whether it's the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, arguing that pediatricians need to be screening patients for, for um, effects of racism and the fact that pediatricians need to change what posters are in their offices and what reading material they have or the kind of activist efforts of, I think if they're called white, white coats for black lives, calling for kind of different kinds of physician training in medical schools around anti-blackness. So there are all these efforts, um, but not a lot of change in the array. So thank you. Thank you for the question. Our next question is from Jackie Peng. Uh, Jackie asks, did you hear from any Black birthing mothers who saw enlisting white doulas as a means to buffer against obstetric violence? Oh, sorry, my uh, thing went out. And medical racism, considering the many medical professionals are white and male. Yeah, it's such a good question. I was I went into this with all sorts of assumptions about uh, what birthing people would want, like in terms of the race of their doulas. And I found, I, I actually found that by and large, my women of color doulas, I did not interview um, perinatal people or folks who had, who had sought doula support. Um, by and large, their clients were women of color who felt that having a woman of color doula in the room meant having someone who would understand the particular and acute challenges of medical racism. I did, you know, um, a few of my interlocutors, and this was fascinating, mentioned to me that white, they found increasingly that white birthing people would seek the services of women of color doulas. And when I would ask, like, what, what do you think that's about? A number of them said they feel like we know birth better or we're closer to birth or we're better at it. So that was really fascinating to hear. Um, and then I interviewed a number of white doulas who primarily worked in either Chicago suburbs or in more affluent parts of the city, primarily at agencies, and they didn't have women of color clients. So I think there's much more work to be done around um, the kind of racial configurations of clients and birth workers and what that means for both the meanings that both clients and birth workers attribute to those configurations. Thank you. Our next question is from Bambi Chap. Bambi asks, uh, that was so fascinating. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if you could say a little more about how you developed and went about conducting this research. Yeah, um, thanks for the question. So it was a hard um, community to <laughs> to get into. Um, I knew that I was interested in birth work. I was particularly interested in what seemed to be a kind of growing um, investment in doulas. And I, I mentioned briefly in the talk, even seeing campus initiatives, which have been on every campus that I've worked on to train women of color to become birth workers. That was fascinating to me. Um, as I mentioned in the talk, Chicago has a kind of vibrant women of color doula scene. And so I started attending um, meetings. There's a women of color Chicago doula face group, like posting in the group, trying to get folks to talk to me. And at first I just couldn't, like nobody wanted to talk. Um, and then I'm in contact with two folks, um, two folks who had just moved to Chicago who were just starting their practices. And both were incredibly generous with their time and also agreed to connect me <laughs> to a host of other doulas which opened the community up for me in really useful ways that I wouldn't have been able to get into otherwise. Um, there's much here, there's much more to be said about this community and there's many more questions that I still have. Um, so it, including what their landscape looks like now, um, Illinois has passed a, a whole suite of maternal health bills that are trying to, to standardize uh, doula care and also to compensate doulas very minimally. And so I'm very curious to see how women of color doulas understand those efforts and feel or don't feel supported by them. Uh, so that's a bit about how how I sort of got into the work and sort of made contact with my interlocutors. <laughs> 
Our next question is from Jessica Berman. Jessica asks, love the focus on black doulas, but wonder where black midwives fit into the equation. Are they partnering with the doulas or is there a tension between the different kind of practitioners? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, so there's lots to be, there's lots to say about that. And midwives are their own kind of complicated figure in the feminist birthing industry. Um, I expected my interlocutors to describe midwives as allies. Um, and often do those described from tension between midwives and doulas. I should say that in Illinois, there are very few black midwives. So when my interlocutors were describing midwives, they were describing white midwives who they were encountering in the space of hospitals. So these were certified nurse midwives. In other words, folks who had considerable amount of training in institutionalized medicine. Um, in fact, one of my doulas, Imani said to me um, that when she went to a delivery at a large research hospital in downtown Chicago, the midwife said to her, um, you know that you shouldn't be burning sage in here, right? Like, don't get all woo-woo with me. Uh, and so she, in particular, articulated how there would often be tension between midwives and doulas. In part, she was narrating that as about the retreat of obstetricians from providing hands-on care. So she would say, she said to me, like, the obstetrician kind of bounces in and says, hey, how's it going? And then leaves. And it's the midwife who's actually there doing most of the work. And so there's this way in which the midwife takes on the attributes of the obstetrician in the context of, for example, the large research hospital. But I think she was also gesturing to the kind of hierarchies that have formed even within these kind of um, feminist birthing professions where midwives um, and lactation consultants is another profession like this, uh, again, like spend considerable amount of money on their certification and are recognized by institutionalized medical spaces as, as, as legible as medical actors in ways that doulas are not. And so there was a lot of, there was a lot of tension there. Um, the last piece, and you, I can say more about this if folks are interested, but midwifery is, is a complicated term because every state has its own rules about midwives and regulates midwives differently. In Illinois, um, certified professional midwives who are the midwives most associated with home birthing are illegal. So, and I don't get into this in the chapter, but when Imani, for example, encourages all of her clients to consider birthing at home, it's super complicated because a midwife assisting a home birth in Illinois is engaged in a criminal activity and can be prosecuted. And in fact, there have been prosecutions in Illinois. Uh, so when Imani had her own children, she drove a uh, midwife in from out of state. Um, so that's a, it's, it's its own kind of complicated terrain and the history of law deciding to um, have so many ways of understanding what a midwife is and treating midwives differently depending on states is is quite complicated. So hopefully that gets at some of some of the question about midwives. I think our next question folds into that question around the legalities. Uh, Jessica asks, is it feasible and viable for organizations to fund the training and certification of black women and women of color doulas into better paid work, such as midwifery? that might increase these women's presence in medical institutions. Yeah, I mean, I think there are all sorts of grassroots efforts around midwifery in particular that are about increasing the numbers of black women who go into the profession. Again, um, with this fundamental belief that the race of a provider makes a fundamental difference in outcomes, uh, in patient outcomes. So I think there's been tremendous efforts around that in midwifery less efforts in the, in the field of lactation, but some. Um, and then again, because midwifery and lactation are two professions that require certification, to call yourself a certified lactation consultant, you must indeed be certified. To call yourself a midwife, you have to have gone to midwifery school and completed a certain amount of tests. Doulas are a kind of different creature, um, at least in part because none of that is required. And I didn't mention this in the talk either, but so many of my interlocutors, when I would say, how did you come to this work? They said, well, I've been doing it forever, right? <laughs> like I've been doing it. And then I decided, hey, I'm gonna do it. Like, I'm gonna call myself a doula. Many folks talked about how they had been going to births for years, how they had always been interested in childbirth. And because um, the profession doesn't require a certification, there's a way in which for so many people it was accessible because you could do it before you were really calling yourself a doula, which feels obviously quite different from midwifery, where as I mentioned, uh, you can't call yourself, I mean, you can, but you'll be arrested. You can't call yourself a midwife. And the state has in general been quite interested in prosecuting um, 
folks who, who practice midwifery in ways that don't conform to state laws. So all this to say, I think that the effort to fund um, black providers in the context of midwifery and lactation is, is, is starting to be up and running, and it's a little bit more complicated in the context of doulas. Thank you. Our next question is from Gloria Chuku. Gloria asks, have you considered the impact of globalization, transnationalism, and generational dynamics on women of color doulas, their practice, and clientele? Yeah, that's interesting. These are the moments when I wish we were in a space so I could be like, tell me more. Because <laughs> I'm curious to hear more about what that means. Um, there are certain theories in the in the context of something else that I read about, which is about breastfeeding um, that have to do with questions of generation and to some extent transnationalism. So, for example, um, in general, public health in the context of the US argues that black women breastfeed at lower rates than white women. And there's been a concerted public health effort to eradicate this disparity for a host of reasons. And one of the reasons that public health uh, scholars argue this, one of the reasons that public health scholars argue this disparity exists is that black families are thought to live in ways different than they used to live generations ago uh, that work that paid work is imagined to have changed the nature of breastfeeding and that public health folks argue um, black folks are less likely to see family members breastfeeding and so are less likely to practice breastfeeding themselves there are a whole host of other reasons for the so-called gap including access to breastfeeding and breast pumping time at work and a, a whole host of other factors but here's a here's a place where this idea of like generationalness, generationality comes into discourses about um, black maternal health disparities. I see it less in conversations about about doulas, where I do see this conversation, and I, I don't know about the transnational piece. I should say I'll think about it more. The other kind of discourse that permeated my interlocutors' responses was about like about kind of ye olden days, right? So like in the olden days. Um, black women saw other birthing black people more. We were closer to birth. It was part of our lives in a different way. We had an intimacy with birth that we didn't have before. I heard that a lot. And I heard a lot about how part of what had been lost, although there were various rationales for why it had been lost, was this kind of inherent knowledge about birth. So a number of my interlocutors talked about how our grandmothers and great grandmothers and great -grandm great great grandmothers all knew how to deliver a baby. They had all done it. And now there's a way in which um, labor and delivery has become foreign to us because of institutionalized medicine taking it over and assuming that it's expert knowledge. So in that way, there was some conversation about, about generations. And we can even think about the term the granny midwives um, as another way that generation gets invoked in conversations about, about reproductive justice and, and birth justice. Thank you. Our next question is Maria Sayeri. Maria asks, thank you, Dr. Nash. Given the difficult work of doing ethnographic work, what were some of the challenges you faced in interviewing doulas, but in particular mothers for this project? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, one, as I mentioned, was finding people. The second um, was the sheer emotionalness of the work, as I mentioned in the session with students earlier today. Um, one of the questions that I would ask all of my interlocutors was tell me about the most challenging birth that you've attended. And so I heard many, many stories of loss and grief um, and, and listened to birth workers um, try to narrate how they sit with and carry other people's grief. One of my interlocutors, for example, described being in a very long labor and her client did not want to have a C-section. She wanted to labor naturally. Um, and so my interlocutor, the doula said, hey, I just got to go home for like 40 minutes, have a shower. I We've been here forever. I just need to have a break. She went home. She had a shower. She came back to the hospital and her client had had a C-section. And this interlocutor felt devastated by this and felt responsible for it, even as doulas narrate and make you sign in a contract that they are not responsible for birth outcomes. They carry, my interlocutors carry this sense of responsibility for how their clients births unfold. Um, so all of that was hard to hear. All of that was hard. Yeah, it was just challenging. And the third piece was just the sheer economic precarity of almost everybody I interviewed. Um, 
I mentioned that almost everybody was working multiple jobs. I would often meet people on their lunch hours. Um, I talked to one person as she was uh, pumping in her 30 minute lunch break. I mean, it was like, you really got the sense of how much folks were juggling um, and how much they were fundamentally committed to birth work, which many of my interlocutors said they would do for free for women of color who needed services. And at the same time, so many of them were struggling, um, were struggling to make ends meet um, or to figure out like day to day, how am I gonna eat? How am I gonna feed my children? So all of that was was quite challenging. I think those were the biggest challenges of the work. I guess I'll say one more thing, sorry. The last piece is, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Chicago. It's a huge city and it's a really segregated city. Um, I was living on the north side of the city. All of my interlocutors lived on the south side. I drove long distances to meet them. And um, Chicago is a, is a city of neighborhoods is what people call it quaintly. Um, I would call it a city where, where uh, gun violence is distributed along racialized and class lines. And so for my interlocutors, the reality of what was happening in Chicago around gun violence was very much part of their experiences of living in the city and very much on their minds. As we're hearing those stories was also quite challenging. Thank you. Our next question is from Chelsea Mays Williams. Chelsea asks, did you notice in discrimination around obese black women? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, two of my interlocutors especially mentioned it. Um, one mentioned how, I read her quote, she described herself as a plus, her, she described her plus size black female body um, and described the ways in which she, it, she understood when her obstetrician encouraged her to have a hysterectomy after she had a second child. She understood that recommendation to be about her race and about her size. Um, another one of my interlocutors described how she felt that clients who were deemed obese were treated um, with a heightened degree of violence and suspicion. I will say, I think that there's a whole taxonomy. I mean, I think all Black women enter medicalized spaces under suspicion, but then I think there's a way in which certain Black perinatal bodies have additional levels of suspicion. One that was mentioned was obesity, another was age. And so um, some of my interlocutors would talk about working with clients who were perceived as young, uh, and some would mention how quote unquote teen mothers were treated um, by institutionalized medical staff. Um, those seem to be categories of black birthing bodies that were, that were treated with like a particularly virulent form of anti-black misogyny. Thank you for that. Our next question is from Cindy Quatch. Cindy asks, first and foremost, loved your presentation. I was wondering, sorry, when a new person enters the queue, it bumps my question up from the screen. First and foremost, love your presentation. I was wondering what was something that shocked you the most as a result of this project? Mm. That's a great question. Uh, something that shocked me the most. Um, there were, I guess there were a bunch of things that shocked me. Um, one was how much my interlocutors believed in home birth. Um, almost all of them celebrated home birth as a really important way of avoiding the death world of the hospital. Um, I, I was just fascinated by that. And I would often, and as I told you, midwives cannot practice home birth in Illinois legally. So I was really interested in understanding what it means to uh, advise your clients to consider home birth when you're essentially advising them to pursue something that the state criminalizes. And I was really interested in how far so many home was seen as a site of safety um, and the hospital side of, of death when feminists have had such complicated views about what home means, right? So, so there, was, there was a lot there that I wanted to think through. Um, other surprises. Uh, I mean, I guess, you know, the biggest surprise that that started uh, my research with this was just the variation in training. I talked to some doulas who, when they described their training to me, in fact, I have this quote in the book, one of my interlocutors said something like, being a good doula is about empathy and kindness. And you can't learn that in a training, she said to me, you either have it or you don't have it. And so she said to me, in some ways, the training is just like moot. It's, it's like it's meaningless. And I was fascinated by that because as I said, some folks describe their trainings as 
as fundamentally about labor. And they would say like, here are the various stages of labor. And, but most of my interlocutors describe their training as about a kind of um, maybe spirit work. And all that was that was really interesting to me just to see that that variation, the variation of training that all falls on under the category of doula. Our next question is from Shaheen Hassan. Shaheen asks, can you please tell us a little more about how unmedicated births empower black mothers? Yeah, I mean, and I should say that when I this, this is not me making this claim, but some of my interlocutors. I think. Um, for a number of my interlocutors, there is a sense that unmedicated births show you what your body can do. Um, Imani says it's like a marathon. And I think one of the things she told me was nobody ever imagines that they can do it. And then they discover they can. A number of my interlocutors described that, that feeling of having endured something um, and having actually learned that your body can do things that you might not have thought it capable of is um, a fundamentally empowering act. And I think that's the key for so many, for my doulas who believed in unmedicated birth as having, as doing political work. Um, it was political because it showed you your strength. It showed you, it showed you that your body can do work you might not have even imagined possible. And I think for so many of my interlocutors, the sense of finding a surprising strength or the capacity to endure was imagined both as empowering and as a set of skills that Black mothers in particular need to navigate the social world. Um, so I think I think that's the best that's the best way I can I I understand I understand their logic. And I think for them, that initial, that initial moment of like of, of bringing life into the world in an unmedicated fashion, is thought to fundamentally change everything that comes after. It's thought to unleash a different kind of, of black mothering practice that's rooted in strength and endurance. Our next question is from Don Beeler. Don asks, I'm interested in your comments on the discourse around maternal care deserts and whether you see a parallel to now critiqued ideas of food deserts. I live in DC where this label has been applied to black communities where maternity yeah. boards have closed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so there's been a lot a lo alongside the attention to black maternal mortality disparities. There's been an increasing attention to maternal care deserts, and you're right, particularly around DC, which a number of people have called the worst place to birth in America. I think the concept of maternal care deserts is really complicated. Um, I think geography really matters for birth. I think it matters in multiple ways, but I don't think it's just about the presence or absence of a local hospital. I think there's a lot of factors at play that create in some of my more recent work, I call it the create birthing geographies. I think there's certainly this question of if, ho if a hospital is present or absent or how far one has to travel to a hospital. Um, but I think major cities, including DC, are shaped by other factors like the predominance of the research hospital. So, I mean, Chicago is another city where this discourse of maternal care deserts became really important because on the south side, a number of hospitals shut their obstetrics wards and said that they were doing it because there simply weren't enough people who wanted to give birth there. The research hospitals were booming though. Northwestern University Medical Center has never had busier years in the last five years. And so, and by the way, they brand themselves. I mean, every bus in Chicago has a sign on the side that says like, Northwestern Hospital, great place to give birth. So, I mean, there's, there's also something happening about the relationship between the research hospital and, um, the small local hospital that shapes these kinds of questions of desert and geography. There's also something that has to do with how states regulate midwives or don't regulate midwives that shapes questions of geography. And there's also questions about urban and rural. Um, I don't, um, this chapter of my research is based in a, in a very large city, um, but where I live now in North Carolina, much of the attention to black maternal health is actually around the question of rurality and the emptying of, of all kinds of medical care, not just maternal health care from rural counties. 
So all this to say, I think geography matters fundamentally with birth. And I think this question of the presence or absence of, of the hospital is one way that geography matters. But I think we have to be attuned to the variety of factors that create, that make some birth geographies vibrant and others barren. Um, yeah, so that's, that's my best answer to that question. Thank you for that question. We have a question now from Maria Mani. Maria asks, did you encounter any mentioning of the role of doulas in helping break language barriers that could pose serious challenges for women of color whose native language is not English during birth? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, to some extent, so most of the women of color doulas who I interviewed um, I would ask them, do you speak languages other than English? Almost all spoke English, but I did interview four uh, Latinx doulas for whom um, being able to speak both Spanish and English was an important part of what they of being in the room. Um, and so they would often talk about their role in in both communicating between patients and providers, but also in having conversations with patients that they did not want providers to be privy to. This actually became a really, this is, I think, a really important part of do the work in the room is what you tell your client when providers are not listening. And so some, some of my interlocutors who spoke Spanish talked about how being able to switch between Spanish and English um, was a tremendous asset to protect their, their clients when they were in the space of the room. Um, one of the... Yeah, and so a few of my interlocutors described, in addition, how um, language and accent discrimination work to um, work to work together to inflict particular forms of violence on women of color birthing people. So, for example, one of my interlocutors, who is Latinx, described an obstetrician who was who would yell, yell. She would always say, "Yell, do you speak English at at patients?" Right. And she would describe how horrible, how violent this felt um, to the breathing people that he was shouting at. And so she wanted to think in particular about how questions of language and perception of being English speaking or non-English speaking um, were producing particular forms of violence in certain in certain spaces in, in Chicago hospitals. Thank you. So we have about four questions left in about seven minutes. So I thought to um two bundles i'll ask you two and then we'll go yep. on to the next two does that sound okay perfect okay uh aneka asks how much do you think the reputation of doulas as individuals who exist outside quote normal acceptable medical spaces impacts black women's trust in doulas and our second question in this bundle is from Lisa Gray. Lisa asks, what, if any way, did generational SES and educational identity and privilege show up in your research for this book? Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I'll start with the first one. So Dula's reputation as being outside of the medical system. How did that impact Black women's trust in them? Such a fascinating question. I mean, I think um, over the course of doing my research, I spent about a year interviewing doulas, the news coverage around doulas took off. <laughs> and so if when I started my research, I would ask doulas, what's hard about your work? They would often say, well, first of all, nobody knows what a doula is. <laughs> so part of what's hard about my work is telling people what I do. That was no longer the case by the time I finished doing my research. And I think it was certainly the case um, from what my interlocutors told me that actually part of how they would describe their work, and this is a term that one of my interlocutors in particular used, was they would describe their work as a mere bodyguard, which is a really interesting phrase to use. And I think speaks to this question of, um, I accompany you to the space of the hospital, but I am not of that space, right? And so I think this idea of, of being able to be in the space of a hospital, but not of it, was actually how many of my interlocutors described the importance and urgency of their work to their clients. Um, I'll drop a footnote on this and say there was an amazing article in the Washington Post, I think it was in 2018, um, about a cluster or group of Black mothers, all of whom were pregnant at the same time, describing their tremendous fatigue at the endless coverage of the Black maternal health crisis. I, there's an amazing quote that says something like, 
you feel like you're supposed to go to every doctor's visits with your highlighted copies of studies about black and maternal death. This is not a time for celebration. It's a time to be on guard. Uh, and yet they were describing their tremendous fatigue at this sense of like of being under siege and having to be to be at guard on guard all the time. They've actually started a conference called the Mom Friends that's intended to be a kind of rupture in this narrative of being always already under siege. But all of the women who were featured in that article talked about how they had hired doulas because that was again seen as an important sort of bodyguard to take with you to the hospital. Um, Generation SES and education. Um, one of the ways this shows up in my project is through the figure of Chicago volunteer doulas, which I talked about for a second in the talk. Chicago volunteer doulas is a fascinating organization um, that provides pro bono doula services to birthers delivering in Chicago city hospitals who request a doula but cannot afford one. The vast majority of folks who uh, request doulas through that program uh, identify as poor, according to the Chicago Volunteer Doulas annual report, and the vast majority are people of color. I will also say that that pool of folks who request doulas through CVD um, tends to skew young. And this most when my interlocutors described to link back to an earlier point, the way that the discourse of teen mom enters the space of the room in hospitals, it was often through cases um, that were referrals to Chicago Volunteer Doulas. Um, so I will say in those cases where birth workers were working with clients from CVD, many of them talked about how obstetricians and midwives would um, treat clients, treat patients in ways that they deemed, they, they, they felt that, their, that patients were being treated a certain way because of how race and class coincide. I will say the other piece of that class that complicates the story with doulas and with Black maternal health care more generally that a number, a number of folks have said that one of the things that unites Black mothers across class is that class is no buffer from Black maternal mortality. Class, class does, one's class status does not change one's vulnerability to um, maternal death, which is really fascinating. And a number of my interlocutors especially mentioned that, that they, that they felt that clients of, a, of an array of economic backgrounds were actually articulating the same anxiety about the space of the hospital, that it was something that unified Black women. So thank you. It took too long for that round robin question, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're doing amazing, <laughs> thank you. So our last two questions, um, the first is from Susan McDonough. Susan asks, did your interlocutors identify as feminists or was there any other theoretical grounding you saw the doulas claiming shaping their understandings of their roles. And then our second question is from Jordan Packett. Jordan asks, I so appreciated this lecture. Thank you. I appreciated Dr. Sayeri's earlier question on how you mentioned heavy grief factoring into Black doula's experiences and work. Are there other specific ways you saw grief being relevant in this research? Thanks. Uh, the first question on feminists. I at the at the end of my interviews, I had this moment where I was like, I have a few meta questions I want to ask. And the first one is about feminism. This would kill the conversation. So it was really fascinating to me to ask that question. Like, do you would you describe your work as feminist? And most folks would just sort of look at me like, what? Um, so it was interesting because I described doulas as part of this feminist birthing industry, which is also how I understand midwives and lactation consultants. But I don't think it's how my interlocutors would describe themselves. The worldview that I would say unites them is, is one about spirituality, which is not something that I yet know how to write about. Um, but spirituality is all over these interviews, whether it's folks who talk about, as I noted, we washed each other's feet in the training, or this is, this work is a calling. Um, a number of the folks who I talked to described kind of practices that they had in the room or before someone went into birth, whether it was lighting a candle or whispering a prayer or call, thinking of a spirit, that to, calling a spirit to enter the room. It was very clear that spirituality was a fundamental way that my interlocutors saw their work. Um, and as I said, I don't, I don't yet know how to write about this or to, or do justice to it because there's this larger question for me about the place of spirituality as a kind of through line in a larger black feminist theoretical tradition that I think is very much there, but also very hard to talk about. And so I'm, I'm not yet sure, um, how to name or describe that, but it feels central to my interlocutors work. The second question was about grief. 
how does grief enter this archive? I think, you know, I, I start my book with a quote from Valerie Castile, Philando Castile's mother. And she says, it's something like, for years I have cried for other women's children. Uh, and I, I felt like that quote describes so much of how my interlocutors described their work, right? They come to their work um, from, a, from a sense of collective loss and collective grief. That's what animates their desire to do this work. Um, all of my, well, I, I told you feminism ended a conversation. All of my interlocutors described how much their work was um, enlivened and shaped by the attention that Black birth work was receiving and by the attention to, to Black maternal health care disparities. But for all of them, it was a sense of like carrying, yeah, carrying a collective grief or a collective sense of loss. Um, I mentioned, I think I mentioned this in the conversation with students earlier, or maybe in the talk. Um, so many of my interlocutors mentioned experiences with loss, whether it was um, helping helping clients through miscarriages, um, delivering babies who had passed already, and how much that grief and loss shaped their experiences going forward as birth workers. Um, and then, you know, finally, so many people described their work as a guard against future loss. And this is, you know, Imani, my interlocutor who talks about the importance of unmedicated birth, talks so much about, the, about seeing birth as entering, birthing people into this community that hopefully guards against, which she seemed to see as um, future loss, which she kind of read as the hallmark of Black motherhood. And so she imagined this community of empowered mothers as something that could guard Black children against this kind of seeming inevitability of violence. And so in that way, I think for her, um, Black motherhood and Black birth work were constituted by an intimacy with loss. That's the work starts from that position and seeks to guard against that loss multiplying. Um, I think there's more to say about, about grief and loss and we can we can always talk more, but those are some, some initial thoughts. Thank you so much for that beautiful conclusion also to our time with you. Um, that's all of our questions. Uh, that is also all of our time. And so um, I'll try to speak for everyone when I just say thank you again, Dr. Nash, for such a brilliant and evocative talk, for your extreme generosity with our questions, um, and for just joining us for the evening. It was really a pleasure. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for coming. So I think that's us wrapped up.